If you've ever played Kerbal Space Program, you're probably familiar with this rocket here. It's called the Kerbal X, it's a stock vessel, and it's present in any sandbox game when you start a new save file in Kerbal Space Program. It's advertised as being able to land on Minmus, and if you're very skilled, you might be able to land it on the Mun as well. But just how far can we push the Kerbal X? Can it go beyond the Mun? Potentially somewhere much further? than the Kerbin system, and maybe we could land on more than one celestial body. Well, today, ladies and gentlemen, that's exactly what I wanted to find out. How far can we push the stock Kerbal X? And so without further ado, let's get on with the mission. I mean, I've already launched it, you probably saw that happen, and we're currently performing our gravity turn. I've deliberately decided to make absolutely no modifications to the craft, I haven't even drained the monopropellant tank inside the command pod, just to try and make this mission as, uh, I don't know, fair as possible, or I guess in the spirit of the thesis that I set out. Uh, the one thing I have done is we've only got one Kerbal on board, it's Valentina there, and she's not got an EVA pack or a parachute or anything, just to save a little bit of mass, because with the most recent update, Kerbals inside command pods actually affect the mass of a craft, whereas before they didn't, it was only if they were in an external command seat that they would influence the mass of a ship. However, I do actually regret this because in hindsight, the Delta V I would have saved from this is negligible and we don't end up coming back to Kerbin with zero Delta V remaining. So I probably could have had three Kerbals on board this thing if I wanted to and had uh, EVA packs and parachutes and all that good stuff. But, you know, it's going to be a long old mission. We're going to be doing lots of gravity assists. Uh, Valentina is going to be inside that command pod for decades, so uh, maybe she'll appreciate the extra space by having it all to herself. In fact, the first uh, sitting in the command pod waiting for stuff to happen is about to start now because I forgot to launch at an EVE transfer window. An EVE transfer window is when EVE is behind Kerbin, and if you were to draw a line from Kerbin to the sun to EVE, the angle that line forms at the sun should be about 54 degrees on the map screen, uh, and I didn't launch at an appropriate transfer window, so we have to do that from low Kerbin or orbit. So already it's been over a year and we haven't even left the Kerbin system. So it's a really good start. But you know, it doesn't matter. Uh, Valentina will be fine. Um, my head cannon for this is that she's going to be going into like stasis. We've got some, we've got a cryogenic pod inside one of those command seats where another Kerbal would normally sit. So there you are. That's, you don't have to write your comments now saying, oh lol, map making Kerbal sit in command pods for years. No, sir. Uh, I they have a stasis, a stasis pod. Please uh, like the video, by the way. My family are all starving, and subscribing is also a thing that you could do that I would very much appreciate. Now, what you might have noticed, it would have been very concerning, is that in order to maximize our Delta V, I used our lower stage, the main sail stage, to perform our tra most of our transfer to EVE, which means that that booster is actually going to be ejected from the Kerbin system and left floating around in deep space, which you know is a cardinal sin on this channel. So I guess at some point we're going to have to perform a mission to go back and recover that booster so that the space dolphins can prosper in peace. So maybe I could do that next week, just recover that uh, booster that I ejected into deep space. Unfortunately, in this case, I didn't really have much of a choice other than to just, just to leave it in space because having it deorbit itself and, you know, not get left stuck in space would have cost us valuable Delta V, which we really don't have all that much of. Especially with that Poodle engine there, which is nowhere near as efficient as something like the nuclear engine or the ion engine, for example. And yes, that is the stock Poodle engine, by the way. You may have noticed, as was the case as well for the mainsail engine on the first stage, that it has the old textures. Uh, the engines haven't looked this way in stock KSP for quite some time. There was a really nice update that made them look a lot better, I think we can all agree. But the textures are still present in the game for Legacy Craft, and I'm guessing that, I, I assume that the Kerbal X craft file is still using the legacy parts. So um, if you're wondering if this will work on the latest version of Kerbal Space Program, you can see the version that I'm playing on in the bottom left hand side of the screen. It's version 1.11. Uh, point one point three zero six six. if you want to be precise. <laughs> so it, it should work in the latest version of Kerbal Space Program as I record this commentary, which for me, it's the 6th of March. I know I'm getting, I'm quite ahead of myself at the moment. I've got to 
busy few weeks uh, up ahead, so I'm trying to get lots of Kerbal commentaries done. Now, I'm not sure if this might just be my version of Kerbal X and with the latest versions of Kerbal Space Program, like if you did a fresh install, if the Kerbal X still has the legacy parts, just because there are a few weird things about my Kerbal X here. The actual ladder, and I didn't realize this till after I needed to the ladder and realized it wouldn't work. The ladder doesn't line up with the command pod hatch. Uh, it's on the opposite side of the ship, so the ladders are basically just dead weight. They're completely they're completely useless, effectively. So uh, I think I probably should have validated my files rather than just assuming the Kerbal X craft file would work okay. But all of this stuff it only serves to make the craft like worse. It doesn't it doesn't serve as advantageous to me. So if you were to use the normal Kerbal X to do this mission for some reason, then um, if yours looks different, it shouldn't, uh, in theory, perform any differently to mine. And here we are performing our second planetary gravity assist. I probably should have mentioned a little bit earlier on where I'm actually going with this video, guys. I was trying to figure out a good place to send the Kerbal X. My initial thought was maybe we should visit Elu because, you know, Elu is the furthest planet from the sun, right? It's a fairly challenging destination. It takes a lot of Delta V to get to, but I don't know. I feel like I, I rely a bit too much on Elu as the metric for a long-range craft, and I feel like I've done a lot of Elu missions at this point. Let's go somewhere else. So I thought, well, where else is, you know, far away and requires a sufficiently impressive amount of Delta V to pull off? And I thought, what about doing two landings? Uh, on One on Pol and one on Bop, which, of course, are two of Jules' moons. So that's what we're going to be doing. We're going to be doing a landing on Pol and landing on Bop. Now, in case any of you hadn't figured out what's actually going on here, why I've got this kind of weird weird route to the dual system. Uh, I decided to try and save as much Delta V as possible by doing a Eve Kerbin Kerbin gravity assist. Uh, it normally takes just over a thousand meters per second of Delta V to do an ejection from the uh, Kerbin system and then another thousand meters per second of Delta V to get an encounter with Joule. So a lot of fuel is needed but you can substantially reduce the amount needed to get from kind of the edge of the Kerbin system to Joule by pinging off Eve and then pinging off Kerbin and then pinging off Kerbin again. This series of three gravity assists means that you can raise your apoapsis around the sun uh, for basically no delta V at all. I think I spent, uh, I don't know how much I spent in total, but it was a very, very small amount compared to what it would have been if I hadn't used gravity assists. If I hadn't used gravity assists, this mission would not be possible. So that's what I was doing. Uh, kind of for the first part of this video. Here you can see me just fine-tuning my second Kerbin gravity assist to get a nice dual encounter. There isn't really much like much I can say in terms of how to do these gravity assists other than just to watch what I'm doing and then have a go yourself. I never really watched any tutorials on how to pull off gravity assists when I first started learning how to use them. I basically just opened up the maneuver node maker, got encounters with planets and moons and what have you, and just had a look at how they influenced my orbit. In fact, actually, uh, I think I think I remember the very first time I did a gravity assist in Kerbal Space Program, at least an intentional gravity assist in Kerbal Space Program, it was completely out of necessity. I did a Minmus mission. This was way before I started making YouTube videos of Kerbal Space Program. I did a, uh, a Minmus mission and I did lots of biome hopping. I think I was trying to farm science or something and I ended up not having enough fuel to get back to Kerbin and I hadn't got any custom quick saves. So I was basically stuck on Minmus and I really couldn't be bothered to do a rescue mission. So I was thinking, well, hang on. We've got a, we've got enough Delta V to get an encounter with the Mun. Is there any way in which I could pass by the Mun to influence my course around Kerbin and lower our periapsis into Kerbin's atmosphere. And after lots of playing around with the maneuver node maker, I managed to get just an encounter with the Mun that would, you know, lower my Kerbin periapsis into Kerbin's atmosphere and get me safely home. So that's kind of how I first started using gravity assists. And from there, I played around with them a bit more. They're very, very useful things to know about for doing dual missions because you can do what I'm doing on screen right now, which is getting an encounter with Tylo. And Tylo's gravity, if you encounter it just right, will fling you into a stable dual orbit without any need for a retrograde burn uh, to circularize. Uh, you want to be encountering Tylo 
at about your periapsis around Jewel, just before your periapsis. Uh, and then you can just modify your encounter with Tyler to get nice and close. And then you can just zoom out on the map screen, see how it affects things. If it ends up ejecting you from the Jewel system, you may be encountering Tylo on the wrong side and getting a gravity boost rather than a gravity break. Um, but it really, my advice is just to experiment with Maneuver Node Maker and eventually you'll just sort of get a knack for gravity assists. Uh, that's probably the most I'm willing to go in terms of uh, something resembling a gravity assist tutorial. I mean, let's be real, if you're clicking on a video showing you how to do a landing on Pol and Bop with the Kerbal X, uh, you probably shouldn't go in with the expectation there's going to be a tutorial. Like, this is not a beginner mission. Uh, it's not a mission I would recommend to anyone, really, right? There's no benefit to a mission like this. The Kerbal X doesn't really have any significant science equipment on it. Does it have any science, science equipment on it at all? I'm not sure if it has, like, a thermometer or something on it. Either way, I'm playing on a sandbox mode, so it's all irrelevant anyway. It's only for the arbitrary challenge of seeing how far you can push the Kerbal X. I thought this would be kind of a nice challenge, right? People have been submitting uh, a few challenge suggestions on the KSP subreddit, and they seem to range from either way too easy, like just land on the man, or um, so something like it's stupidly hard or impossible, like the guy that was like, just build a, a bridge across the Drez Canyon, which took Strats and Blitz, of all people, several months to pull off, and everyone else including myself, assumed it was completely impossible because of the uh, KSP physics limits. And the only way Stratum Blitz was able to do it was by exploiting flaws in the KSP physics um, KSP physics engine. Highly recommend that video, by the way. Uh, if you just search Strats and Blitz Drez Bridge, I'm sure there can't be that many videos with that title, so it should be fairly easy to find. Uh, but yeah, I feel like this is kind of a, a good mission for a challenge suggestion because it's accessible to anyone. Everyone has the ship, and I think, I'm sure Console KSP has this ship as well, uh, but it has a scope to be very, very challenging if you want to make it challenging for yourself. Like for newer players, something like a ghillie landing, while not particularly difficult, could be challenging because ghillie, uh, ghillie takes a fairly similar amount of delta V to land on, like, to the MUN. I think the MUN takes marginally less delta V, but it's not significant. But it has the added challenge of an interplanetary encounter with Eve and then getting an encounter with Gilly, which can be a fairly challenging thing to do. So for, like, newer players who aren't that experienced but are trying to push the boat out, it's a good challenge for them. And then you've got people like myself. I don't think it's... Is it arrogant to say I consider myself fairly good at Kerbal Space Program at this point? We have scope to try and make things super difficult by doing things like, you know, two, two dual moon landings uh, or an ELU landing. I mean, ELU would be the other. Th we definitely have enough Delta V to do an ELU landing. I mean, not after doing a Pol and Bop landing. Um, there's a gauntlet right there, but I'm pretty sure it's impossible. Um, yeah, it, it, rather than doing Pol and Bop, you could try and do an ELU landing. So maybe that could be the gauntlet I could throw down. See if you can pull this off, but do an ELU landing rather than a pole and bop landing or maybe you could try something else like um mun and minmus is that i don't actually know if this this doesn't have enough delta v for mun and minmus i'm not i don't think i can't remember I, it's very it's very it's very um it's very late for me guys it's been a long week and i i'm a bit i'm in a bit of stress actually because i'm trying to do this commentary in as little takes as possible because i mentioned earlier that I'm recording this on March the 6th. Well, not anymore. At some point, I paused and then had my dinner, and then I just went to bed. I didn't carry on recording the commentary. And now it is March the 13th, is where I sort of picked back up on the recording of this commentary. So I've just published the uh, Space Station Upgrade video. Thank you, everyone, by the way, for the million views. I'm now, like, if I, if I say this then it will change the past and the future. I don't, I don't know what I'm trying to go with this. But basically, I'm trying to do this in as little take as possible because a couple of days ago, I uh, I broke my hand and it's in, a, it's in a cast. So I've only got one hand and it's really difficult to edit videos when you only have one hand. And I broke my right hand as well. So all I've got is my left hand to edit this video and it's very difficult if I have to keep on pausing my commentary to cut something out or restart something. My setup is I have my keyboard obviously and then I've bought one of those like USB trackpads. It's like a laptop trackpad because I tried to use a mouse with my left hand and it was just impossible. So I've got a I've got a laptop trackpad and a keyboard and that's it to do all the editing. And Sony Vegas when you're trying to resize stuff you often need to hold down control and click and drag which is very difficult to do with just my left hand. So by trying to minimize the number of cuts and pauses I need to take in this commentary uh, makes it a bit easier, which may be why it might it might have got the impression that like the earlier part of this commentary seemed a lot more focused and a lot more, 
uh, I don't know, like almost scripted. It wasn't scripted, but I was like paying a lot more attention to what was on screen and trying to keep what I was saying relevant to exactly what was happening on screen. But now um, that a commentary style like that often requires a few different cuts and takes to get make sure everything is synced up nicely. Uh, that's not happening now. So you may, if in case you got the impression that my commentary has become slightly more rambly and disjointed and has a few pauses where really a cut should have been made, uh, that is why. But I'm doing my best, guys, and I do it for the money. I mean, I do it for you. <laughs> should I cut that bit out? Nah, it's fine. Here's our, uh, what was that? Was our bopping counter? Our polling counter. Yeah, I definitely know. I definitely know the names of uh, the planets and moons in Kerbal Space Program. You may have noticed our gravity assist odyssey did not end with the Eve Kerbin Kerbin gravity assist to get to Joule. Uh, obviously, we did the Tylo gravity assist to capture into Joule orbit. And then I used a few gravity assists from Laith and Tylo to get a nice refined pole encounter. Again, just to uh, maximize our Delta V savings because uh, I realized that we were going to be pretty close in terms of the old Delta V budget. We don't have that much to work with considering the fact that uh, the pole and bop landings themselves are going to eat into our Delta V budget fairly substantially. A pole landing and then a pole takeoff as well would be 130 meters per second. So double that to 260 meters per second for a, um, an optimized pole and bop landing. Sorry, an optimized pole landing and takeoff. And then a uh, bop takes 230 meters per second to land on in an optimized way. Uh, so that doubles to uh, 460 <laughs> I'm Trying to do this mental... I'm trying to do make things easy for myself and do it in one take. And I'm giving myself challenging mental math equations. Uh, and I, I know now that doubling 230 is not a particularly difficult question. But when you're on the spot and... You know, it, it, it's difficult, guys, okay? It's very stressful. But there's uh, bop, a, a bop landing is 230 meters per second. So doubling that, it becomes 460 for a, po a bop landing and takeoff. And don't forget, this is just like the optimized Delta V figures. And I'm not gonna, it's not going to be a very optimized landing. Like here, I landed on a big steep slope. So I sort of had to puddle hop my way down to a flatter bit of terrain. Luckily, Pol is a fairly forgiving place to land on. I mean, it's even easier to land on than Minmus. And you guys probably know that Minmus is fairly easy to uh, slow yourself down on, even with things like nuclear engines. It's very easy to quickly decelerate to landing velocity and subs and um, if you need to adjust where you're landing, it's fairly easy to do that. So yes, uh, you may be worried at this point that we have disembarked the vessel and we don't have a ladder to get back on and we don't have an EVA pack either. Luckily, uh, Valentina, she's very acrobatic and she could just jump up and grab onto the ladder. So it was fine, but yes, did... Um, to get a bit worried that we wouldn't be able to get back on the ship at that point. Um, unfortunately, I tried to do this on Bop as well, like jump and grab the uh, ladder in the capsule, and unfortunately, I just couldn't do it. So for our Bop landing, I'll just be flopping the vessel over on its side, and we can just disembark um, sideways. I mean, Bop's gravity, while higher than Pol's, is still low enough that the ship can right itself via SAS. Uh, it's not like the Mun, where once things fall over, it's very difficult to get them to flip back up. Um, if you guys are familiar with Minmus landings again, you'll know that it's fairly easy to flip the ship back up using SAS or RCS control, which of course this ship has both of. Um, you may have noticed that um, our monopropellant has uh, been used slightly, and that's because the monopropellant thrusters of the command pod are fairly good for doing very, very fine adjustments to orbits where the Poodle engine has slightly too high thrust the thrust of the Poodle engine is slightly too high for the level of accuracy that I need. And that's where the RCS thrusters can be quite useful. By lowering the thrust limiter of the RCS thrusters, uh, I said thrust a lot in that sentence just there, uh, it makes it easier to do like real fine-tuned maneuvers uh, to our orbit. So that's why I've been using some of the monopellant, in case anyone was wondering why the monopellant has been slowly draining at parts in this mission. And there is our BOP encounter. Now, it's going to take a little, uh, a fair chunk of fuel to circularize at BOP, just because you might have noticed that uh, BOP is at a slightly tilted orbit around Joule. When it comes to doing our BOP circularization, we're going to have to overcome that difference in inclination around Joule. So it's actually going to be fairly expensive considering BOP's relatively low gravity well. It's going to be over 400 meters per second to circularize at BOP. 
Now, this is not going to be an issue because I've been fairly frugal with our fuel expenditure up to this point. Uh, we've still got 1,300 meters per second remaining, so easily enough to perform our, what is that, 412.9 meter per second circularization around BOP, and then easily enough for our subsequent 230 meter per second landing and 230 meter per second takeoff. And again, Probably takeoff and landing are going to be a little bit more expensive than that just because I'm not going to get a perfectly fine-tuned and optimized landing because, again, we have enough fuel to have a bit of wiggle room. Um, you might be getting a bit concerned, though, if you've ever done a mission to Joule before, that often it does take quite a bit of Delta V to get back to Kerbin. Um, and so we're not going to be able to do, we're not going to be able to get back to Kerbin, basically, just relying on our engines. We're once again going to be calling on our old friend Gravity Assist to uh, eject from the Joule system. T should I go over this now? I feel like I probably shouldn't because um, when I actually get to, when it comes time to executing this Gravity Assist, I'll have run out of material to talk about. And it will probably just be me screaming into the microphone. How's that for a... An old meme. I mentioned that in Planet Coaster as a joke, and then everyone got really hyped because I mentioned it for a specific episode. I think I said whilst I was. This was my old series, Velocity Lake, by the way, that nobody watched. So feel free to check out that entire series if you want something to binge, please. <laughs> uh, I mentioned they're like, oh yes, I'm slowly losing my mind doing these Planet Coaster commentaries. I think by episode 56, it's just going to be an episode filled with me screaming. And literally, as the episodes rolled on. Uh, people just started getting more and more hyped in the comments for this so-called screaming episode. For the record, I didn't make a screaming episode, so you don't need to skip episode 56 <laughs> if, if you choose to watch the Velocity Lake playthrough. Um, but yes, now I feel like I shouldn't make these jokes because I'm going to just cause hype for something really you shouldn't be getting hyped for. A screaming episode would be horrible, right? Anyway, uh, I mentioned I couldn't talk about the gravity assists to get back to Kerbin because when it came to doing them, I'd have nothing to talk about. But now we have I have managed to ramble through the entirety of the bop landing so now we can actually talk about doing our gravity assist to get back to Kerbin so I'm going to do two the first is going to be with Tyler which is going to fix our inclination to be more equatorial around Joule and more in line with the orbit of Leith which is going to provide our second gravity assist and that's going to eject us out of the Joule system entirely and get us all the way down to the level of Kerbin at which point it's going to be fairly easy to just do a small burn to get a Kerbin encounter. So that's going to be what we're doing. Here you can see me plotting our initial Tylo encounter. I'm just trying to get our orbital line to look fairly, you know, similar in terms of the plane to uh, Tylo and Leith. So that's what the main purpose of the Tylo gravity assist is going to be. And as you can see, it also lowers our dual periapsis to, uh, you know, dip within the orbital kind of reach the gravity well <laughs> of Leith. So that was kind of the main purpose of the Tylo gravity assist. And here I'm just sort of fine tuning it a bit here. Do I need to talk about anything else? No, I think I'm just going to go ahead, go ahead and execute that now. There is Tylo there. And now we can go ahead and plan a maneuver node to get a lathe. Oh, cheeky little Val encounter just there. I'm still I'm adding that to the list of gravity assists that we did for this mission, even though technically I didn't really need a Val gravity assist and I didn't really plan to execute one either. Anyway, here we can see me plotting our lathe encounter. And there we are. And as you can see, our orbital line, you blink and you miss it, but you might have seen our orbital line intersects the level of Kerbin. So it's going to, we don't need to do any further burns. So 16.2 meters per second to uh, alter our orbit like that, when normally would it, it would have cost uh, much, much more than that, like 800. I would have no idea. It's like the best part of a thousand meters per second uh, to do a burn like that without, the, without being able to use gravity assists. And there we are. So once we've got that, we're just going to create a maneuver node and just play around with retrograde, prograde, radial in, radial out uh, to force a Kerbin encounter. Oh, first thing we need to do, though, is uh, make sure our lathe periapsis is actually outside of its atmosphere. Otherwise, we'll just burn up a bit prematurely at lathe. I used a puff of RCS to adjust that, by the way. You may have noticed the RCS. Uh, indicator lit up for a second and our mono propellant dr drained just a bit. Um, that's what I was doing there, just a bit easier. When you're doing lateral adjustments like that, I find it easy to just quickly do a quick puff of RCS rather than reorienting the whole ship to make changes like that. And then you can see me making a maneuver node to um, to get our Kerbin encounter. There we are. So it's predominantly using radial in, radial out, and retrograde and prograde. I used a cheeky little bit of um, 
and normal and anti-normal adjustment, but the bulk of the forcing of the encounter is going to be with radial in, radial out. Now, normally for these sorts of hyper-efficient missions, I often do it in an SSTO aircraft, which means that we have to really, really be thinking about minimizing our re-entry speed. Usually, at this point, I would be doing a Kerbin gravity assist rather than just a straight-up Kerbin encounter um, with the atmosphere, uh, so that we could do another Kerbin gravity assist and then an EVE gravity assist. Basically, the exact opposite of how we got to Joule. I would do a gravity assist at Kerbin, another gravity assist at Kerbin, and then a gravity assist at EVE, and then we can encounter Kerbin nice and slowly, and the ship would completely survive re-entry. However, I don't need to do any of that, because this is the Kerbal X. It's got, it's like an Apollo craft, isn't it? So we can just detach the lower stage and re-enter using our, we've got a heat shield, effectively. So re-entry heating wasn't really an issue. We've only got half of the potential ablator that this thing could have. That's just how Kerbal X ships. But with ablative heat shields in this game are super overpowered. Like, you really, I don't think I've ever needed anywhere close to having all of the ablator on a heat shield. And this is an extreme use case, right? We're coming in very, very fast. Fast, uh, compared to kind of the intended re-entry speeds of the Kerbal X, like it's intended to be used as a Minmus and Mun rocket. So the expectation that you'd be coming in a lot slower than what we're going to be coming in at, and even still, we're not going to be using all of our ablative heat shields. It's not going to be an issue um, in case any of you were concerned that our ablator is only at half of its uh, potential. Not much more to do now other than just uh, wait for our orbit to swing around. Valentina, of course, in stasis at this point. And then we can wake her up and perform a small adjustment burn to get to that Kerbin encounter. I mean, I say small burn, it's only it's 126.8 meters per second. So fairly substantial, but I think we can all agree it's still a lot less than what it would have been had we not had that lathe and Tylo gravity assist to get um, the bulk of our Kerbin encounter done. And there it is. So now she's doing very, very small puffs with the RCS. I've actually set the thrust limiter of the RCS to be super low as well, which goes to show just how minimal these burns are, uh, just to get our curb in periapsis within the atmosphere and fairly low in the atmosphere. Like, I didn't want it to be too low where the re-entry heating would be too extreme, but I didn't want it to be too high and we wouldn't slow down sufficiently and we'd end up on an escape trajectory, but without any engines or anything to uh, get us on another Kerbin encounter. We haven't even got an EVA pack for Val to use to push the ship to a better position if we had to do that. So for this mission and most missions of this nature, I tend to aim for about 30 kilometers uh, as a safe periapsis height to enable us to uh, you know, decelerate sufficiently so that we land, uh, but not go too quickly and end up burning up. So, a bit of a temperature gauge showing up, but it doesn't get anywhere near to dangerous levels, so it's fine. Now, we are 26 and a half minutes into this commentary. I probably should have said a long time ago that I have actually made a shorter version of this mission. It's a music video. I like making music videos from time to time. Uh, it's not monetizable because it uses copyrighted music by the Electric Swing Circus. Uh, so I don't make any money off the music video. So if you want to watch the music video, uh, you can click a link in the description and in the pinned comment and maybe on screen as well. Uh, I don't make any money off of it. It's all been monetized by the record labels. There probably will be an ad, but I didn't place that ad there. If you want to watch that, I thought it was a good video. But I hope you enjoyed this. And, you know, maybe maybe you want to try this challenge for yourself. How far can you push the Kerbal X? It was at this point I noticed, actually, that there was a, a Beobab tree. You know, that surface feature that was added ages and ages ago. And I just, I've just never seen one. I've seen pictures of it, but I've never seen one. But I noticed when we had our parachute deployed and we were descending down to the surface, there it was. It was a Beobab tree. So let's go and have a look. So uh, Valentina had a, a short jog to do no rest for the wicked right she's just come back from her very very long space mission already she's been going on a she's going on a marathon to go and have a look at the tree there it is i don't really know what else to say but i i've never seen one before in kerbal space program with my own eyes so thought it'd be nice just to check one out so there you go there you go guys there's a nice tree there there's the other part of this kerbal space program challenge that i've set how far can you push the kerbal x but you've also got to you've also got to go to the baobab tree at the end and have a little lie down underneath it and that's it that's my video uh, if you want to watch more videos like the one on the left that could just be the music video right the one on the right is um another one that youtube thinks you like because it was automatically selected um that's that's everything uh, thank you so much for watching everyone and i'll see you on monday for another episode of space this 